Hey, it's Sarah Burke here from the Women in Media podcast. And before we get started on a new episode, could I get you to hit like, follow, subscribe, hit the bell, whichever app you do your podcast listening in. Make sure you're all set up so you know when there's a new episode and you can help spread the word. Oh, and if you're so inclined, could I ask you to leave a review if the app that you're using does that? You're the best. All right, let's get to the show. I'm Sarah Burke, and this is the Women in Media podcast. Welcome to my last episode of 2021, featuring a friend and colleague who's inspired me since the first day I met her. Not only does she host talk and comedy shows, but she also set out to fix a little problem in the industry. There wasn't enough material, and I realized that there are some headliners in this country, women that have been doing it for 20 plus years that had nothing. There was definitely a disparity. And obviously there are more men than women, but even if we break it down into kind of statistics, women still weren't recording at the same rate as men if we look at like the percentage of people who are recording and so I, I was mad for a couple of years and so I was like look I'll help people get a little bit of extra money and it snowballed and got away from me my guest today is Allison Dorr the host of Sirius XM's Breakdown on Canada Talks and the founder of Howl and Roar Records a female-centric comedy label how are you? Hi Sarah Burke I miss you all the time. You were one of my favorite people to see in the office. We also, just so people know, had desks where like we were facing each other. There's a like a little bit of a wall divider between us, but I could just peek over the top and see you. <laughs> yes. And it's been, uh, I haven't seen you in like uh, 18 months at least. Aside from you having me as a guest on your show when I launched the podcast, and thank you for that, I think about you all the time and the great work you're doing. Not only do I love what you stand for, but I love the people you stand up for. Oh, that's so nice. I think, you know what, I'm someone who I have very uh, strict ideas about how I think life and people should be. And I'm very well aware that the majority of the world does not work that way. And so I'm really adamant. What I always say is the world's not fair, but I can be. I love and that. So I'm big on like business ethics and the way I treat people and people before profit and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, that's just how, and don't get me wrong. There's days where it's very hard. Of course. And, but that's how I go, how do, how would I, what's the ideal I want the world to be? Well, if I'm not doing it, how can I expect it of anyone else? How can we drive that change? Right. So um, that's just sort of the baseline of how I kind of do everything I do. Founding your own record label with a, a female focus, Howlin' Roar Records. Where did that initial idea come from for you? Like, why was there a need for this in the comedy industry? Okay. Well, I always tell people, this came from vengeance uh, because so much of what I do does. Uh, I think, if, you know, vengeance can be a very healthy thing if you harness it correctly. But what happened was um, it was kind of a, a cascade of a few things. I no longer wanted to perform. I didn't want to tell jokes anymore. I, when I got into radio, I found out that interviewing people and uh, connecting with people in that way was really what I truly loved and what I wanted to do. And as I started edging out of performing stand up, though, it was it was a bit of an existential crisis because you identify so heavily as a comedian. And I had been in doing stand up for 15 years. And so I started to have this like, well, if, if I'm not a member of the comedy community, who am I? Um, so that was a little part of it was, you know, trying to stay at least on the periphery of this community that I'd been in for so long. And then I was asked to host and curate a show for the Canadian comedy channel on Sirius channel 168 um, featuring women. And when I got access to sort of all the jokes we had in the system, I realized that I wouldn't be able to do a weekly show just on Canadian women because we didn't have enough uh, jokes in there. I remember you, I remember you searching and like, because I was working in the music department in the same system, you, we kind of went back and forth about like how to find you the taught me, yeah. you taught me how to use it. There wasn't enough material. And I realized that there are some headliners in this country, women that have been doing it for 20 plus years that had nothing. And, and so it just seemed that, um, 
it, there was definitely a disparity. And obviously there are more men than women, but even if we break it down into kind of statistics, women still weren't recording at the same rate as men if we look at like the percentage of people who are recording. And so I, I was mad for a couple of years and I just started yelling at women like record stuff. And that did not work. You'll be shocked to hear just <laughs> screaming at people. Not always effective. So initially I just thought I would do this on a very small scale. And because now that being in radio, I'm much more familiar with the audio side of it. I know what a really quality recording sounds like. I've been a comedian. I understand that side. So I thought I'll low key help some women uh, record. And, and it's because one of the only places to make money as a comedian is from royalty checks from plays on Sirius XM comedy channels. Not say. It's literally one of the, like it, touring. Yes, you make a little bit, but there's very little money for comedians these days. And so I was like, look, I'll help people get a little bit of extra money and I'll low key do it. And, you know, I'll just help a few people. And it snowballed and got away from me. And the interest in, in working with me and just everything that happened, like all of a sudden, one day I was like, I think I'm starting a label. <laughs> and six months later, we had our launch. And so it really happened very quickly. And it was kind of like a whole bunch of things came together to make it happen. And then as I was starting to meet with people about it, I realized like there is a need not just for women and women identifying comedians. And so 70%, also I don't like anything exclusionary. That always weirds me out a little bit. So 70% of our focus and output is on women. In the remaining 30%, priority is given to men in marginalized communities. Uh, we always say like, no one's not welcome, but to be honest, the likelihood of a straight white cisgender male <laughs> Recording with us is pretty low, uh, with the exception being my brother, because you know what? Nepotism is going to get you in the end, no matter what. Um, and for the record, that's John Doerr, if anyone's yes. wondering. Yes. And so, uh, but it, it's because every other label is heavily for those men, right? It was like, you guys don't need me. Yeah. There are people that need my help and it's just doesn't happen to be this, this one community. So that's really how we kind of came to be. And I think at this point, like this year, certainly we're well over the 70% when it comes to women. Um, I think we're probably closer to 90, but that's good to see. And I've noticed other labels have started recording women a lot more. And, and maybe that's something that you can hang your hat on, too, is that you've inspired other labels to be a little more cognizant of that in their own work. I mean, I think you're putting it real nice. I think <laughs> they've realized there's competition and they're trying to scoop up, but it benefits me and what I tell everybody, because someone else noticed it and said, does that bother you? Because that's your thing. And I said, my whole goal with is this that? was for more women to record. Yeah. I don't care who they do it with. I love it. Yeah. And so I was like, well, if it is competition based, if that's why these other labels are doing it, jokes on them because I win no matter what. So I wouldn't call myself the savviest business person and starting a label. I'm like, neither would I. <laughs> I'm thinking in my brain about about how you would start a label. Mm -hmm. were, were you like so intimidated about the business side? How did you find that side? I mean, it was a steep learning curve. And I am certainly not business savvy. And I'm a big believer in you bring in people to do the things you don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, and no, I had no, if you go on like entrepreneur websites and stuff like that, and the stuff you need to have, if you want to like apply for grants or anything like that, the stuff you need to have, I go, I never did any of that. I have none of that business plan. Don't have one. I uh, have a vague idea in my brain about how it's going to go. Don't know. And so I, I think the key for a lot of people and definitely for me is just jump and, and you know? find, you know, and find the people with the most exciting content and hope it speaks for itself. Well, yeah. And then along the way, it's like, okay, this is a learning curve. I have to have this, like it's, you know, I had to hire a lawyer. I had to get incorporated. I had to, uh, now I have an accountant and a bookkeeper because 
the number side of things, these are things I, that side I could do on my own, but knowing me, A, I won't, and B, the amount of stuff I would have to learn to make sure I've crossed my T's and dotted my I's, I don't have time because the first year it was just me and the sound engineer <laughs> and our sound engineer, Matt, we met, he's one of the best in North America. The only reason this label is off the ground is because we've been friends for over 20 years and he worked on deferred payment for the first year and a half. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Cause he just liked the idea and he was like, yeah, obviously I'm going to do it for you. And I said, I can't afford you. I don't. And you know, so we worked it out and um, he's fully paid back now and amazing, you know, gets paid as we go and uh, gets a Christmas bonus <laughs> and uh, and stuff like that. And but it was just me and him for the first two and a half years. Like I just recently brought on Melanie Dolling, who is saving my life and just the best. And so now we're a team of three. But like for the yeah, for the first year and a half, it's like I didn't get paid for the first two years. I didn't it was so much to learn and I cried a lot and I made a billion mistakes, but you know what? You figure it out. You go, I, cause you don't have another choice. So this is, this is something that I think so many women can learn from. What's one of those mistakes that has like set you up for a much better future. <laughs> the first thing that always comes to my mind and the first mistake I think I made really, uh, Oh, well, there's two things. Okay. Number okay. one, when, if you're going to start a business, Take how much money you think you need and double it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Because you need more. Trust me. And then the other thing is I got so excited about the label and we got a logo made and I love our logo. And I was so excited. And I was like, you know, what people are going to want. They're going to want. You got merch. that on chapstick. You got that on T-shirts. I remember. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess how much of that stuff is in my storage locker right now. Oh no. So much of it. So I got so excited. I spent all this money, like before our first show even, cause I wanted it at the launch show and I want all this kind of stuff. It, it, no one cares about record label merch unless that record label is big. Okay. And so I literally, yeah, I bought everything. I bought everything I thought was fun. I bought everything I would want to buy with our logo on it. And yeah, I'm still carrying that garbage around. I donated a hundred of the t-shirts uh, to an organization that I work with here in Toronto that helps elder homeless men. Uh, Cause I was like, no, do you know how many of these I have? Do you guys want, they're brand new, brand new t-shirts. Let's get you closed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I donated a hundred mugs to them. Cause I wow. had, I had 300 mugs <laughs> three years later. I had 300 mugs like, uh, but to me, first of all, I still love all that merch and I still wear my tees and I have a bunch of the mugs in my kitchen. The mugs are great. Get big mugs if you're doing merch, guys. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, those were two of the things. I needed more money than I thought I did. And then I spent a chunk of that money on all kinds of merch that I was sure everyone was going to want to buy. And I and don't get me wrong. We sell a little bit here and there, but I really stopped <laughs> I have a feeling that that'll come back and all of that will get used. So hopefully that stuff can be used at shows you have in the future anyway. Well, and the thing I, ha I have to remember is that when people come to our shows, they're coming to support the comic. So it's not really about Howl and War. And I kind of forgot that. I'm like, it's a good shirt with a cool logo. And people are like, yeah, but I don't, I'm here for my friend. Right. Right. Hmm. That is a good business a lesson. It's a good business yeah. lesson, though, in general, about um, remembering your intention, really. Yeah, totally. Right? Totally. Because yeah, we can all get lost in that stuff. So imposter syndrome seems to be a really big thing I've found on this podcast. Some of the most like powerful women in the industry that I've spoken to have all referred to this idea of not thinking they're good enough at mm -hmm. some point. And I think that's crazy. And comparing themselves to others. Uh, when you were starting this label, you know, you got to be thinking about what are the other labels going to think? Uh, it's got to be in the back of your head. I'm sure you're past it now, but how did that go at the beginning? Well, I'll be honest with you. So even before that, um, I've always been, you know, self-worth and, and self-esteem have never been my strong suits. And, and then in comedy, especially when I started, there were way less women when I started and we were very much uh, and I don't think this was conscious on other people's parts, but you're set up to root against each other and yeah. to feel like there's only a 
small piece of the pie for women. And if that woman gets it, she's taking your pie. And I was very unhappy and bitter and I didn't like myself. And, you know, I started, I love personal growth books and podcasts and all that kind of stuff. And I started working really hard on not comparing myself to other people and then extending that into comedy and being like, what if when someone else gets something that is something I would like to get to, instead of being mad and instead of feeling like I'm funnier than them, why did they get it? What if I celebrate for them and then focus on my jokes and my career? And so I really started putting that into practice long before this label ever came into existence. And so it becomes second nature on some level. Like I still have those moments where I compare, where I look at another label and go, why did they get that comic? I want her. And then as soon as that happens, I step back and go, nope, that's not what we're doing here. And so it wasn't as also... (laughs) People are secretive. That's the other thing. You start a business, people are secretive. I I reached out to a couple of labels being like, oh, can I pick your, and not just comedy ones, some music ones. And so it's like, I'm not even in competition with the music ones being like, um, you know, here are some specific questions because you have to really. Like people, you liked what they were doing and you wanted to like hear And when you have questions, you can't just say like, can I pick your brain and that's it? Because that's, people are like a million people say that and you're just wasting my time. And so I would ask a few specific questions or whatever. and, And nobody said yes. Nobody. Nobody. Huh. I even had people like in the industry connect me to someone. Uh, she, she was like, oh, this guy will talk to you for sure. I'll send an email, whatever. And then I responded to the email and nothing. Hmm. So people are very proprietary yeah. uh, when it comes to business. And I'm just not like that. I'm Uh, There was a time in my life where I was, but my whole thing now is I'm all about collaboration. I'm all about, hey, if more people are in it, the pie is going to get bigger. You know, Mm -hmm. we're just going to bake more pies. Like, don't worry about it. And which isn't to say, again, I don't have competitive feelings, but I'm someone who used to indulge those feelings too much and ended up a bitter, angry person. And it makes me feel worse in the long run. And so when I look at what other labels are doing, a lot of the time, I think, oh, well, I don't care what they're doing. It's not about what they're doing. It's about what I'm doing. And good for them. Good for them and whatever their focus is and whatever. But this is, this is about what I'm doing and it's separate from that. So I really try to smash those feelings down because they don't bring me further. Mm-hmm. And I think those kinds of competitive feelings, a lot of people say you have to have them in business. It's mercenary. It's you got to go out, you got to conquer. You have to hey, that's one way to do it. But I don't know how you stay happy and live with yourself doing that. So for me, it's all about anytime I start feeling those feelings, taking it back to, okay, but what am I doing? And what is my goal? And focus on that instead. Hmm. You've been an open book about your mental health journey too. And I think it plays a big role in this wonderful positive mindset that you're in now. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know a little bit about that story, um, mm-hmm. if, you, if you're comfortable to talk about- Cole's notes? Done. Yeah, Cole's notes, give us. So when I was 23, I had a nervous breakdown. Um, my whole life I had issues. And then when I was 20, I was finally diagnosed um, with uh, clinical depression and generalized anxiety disorder. And then there was another- diagnosis thrown in there because I seem to have an additional emotional component. Um, I no longer fit the criteria of that diagnosis. So it's just interesting. I think when it comes to mental health, sort of everything's a spectrum. And, and I think at one point I was absolutely much less well than I am now. Um, and so when I was 23, everything kind of came to a head and I, and you're supposed to call it a major depressive episode now, but I think nervous breakdown sounds like very art deco and fancy. (laughs) Do it, whatever. And and so (laughs) I keep saying it. Um, so yeah, I couldn't work. I had to move back in with my parents. Um, I just couldn't function as a person, you know, suicidal ideation, all that fun stuff. And then I started essentially self-medicating with drugs. So then when I was 30, Um, I went to rehab and really just because I just got to the point where I had had always had a lot of big dreams. And I just realized one day 
the time has come to make a choice. Either I accept that because the idea of not being high was so scary because feelings hurt so bad. And but I realized, OK, either I choose now, I stop with these dreams, I stop with the fantasies that I have of what I could be and who I could be. And I accept that I choose drugs and this is the life. Was and it gonna, about showbiz at all at that point? Oh, always. Think? Yeah. Okay. It's always been about showbiz. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my whole life, I thought I would be an actor. And I do love acting. And I did. But I think in my 20s, when I was mentally unwell and um, and then also doing a lot of drugs, stand up is just so accessible because you can do it any night of the week. You don't need a cast. You don't need a set. There's someone's doing an open mic somewhere. So you just go out and do it. Um, and I had never wanted to do stand up. I was always about being an actor, but my brother kept encouraging me after he started. Well, look at how well you speak. Like I could listen to you speak all day, honestly. Stop it. I mean it. I mean it. Oh my God. I love you. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I don't want to brag, but I do love talking, <laughs> but so yeah, I, I, um, basically yeah when I was 30 and at that point I also was in therapy for a really long time I had the same therapist for 20 years until she retired and she was really great and like um hugely formative in in saving my life and and helping me find the things that work for me and find my way and so even though I was self-medicating I was also doing therapy and working on myself and so a lot of growth did happen up until my 30s but I just realized like this is a point where I have to choose and I kept saying, cause I kept trying to cut down on my own or quit on my own. And it just, oh, like I could not make it more than like three hours. <laughs> and I kept saying, you know, if I could just like go to a cabin in the woods somewhere where for like a month where I couldn't get drugs and just, you know, had to stick it. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, that's called rehab. <laughs> that's when you go somewhere for yeah. three or four weeks where you can't get drugs to get past your addiction. Um, and so I went to rehab and cause I just wasn't ready to give up yet. Right. I was like, mm, I feel like it's a some brave things... decision. Thank you. I feel very lucky too, that it was one I made for myself. Like, well, I, it was getting to the point in my life where my family and my friends were like, mm, this is bad. Right. Like, mm -hmm. what should we, what should we do? Um, but I feel very lucky that I came to it on my own because when I was in rehab, it was only me and one other person that were there voluntarily. Everyone else had either been intervented by their family or court ordered to be there. And what I realized is you have a way better chance uh, when you get out of rehab if it's really what you want, right? Because a lot of people there were, were like, I'm, it, it means you were ready. Yeah, you're ready and you're more willing to, to take in what you're learning and to really give it a go. And, um, and so I feel like I'm so lucky on so many levels. I'm also incredibly lucky that I, like I felt this rehab was covered by OHIP. Amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't work for three months and I had to borrow a bunch of money to my parents so that I didn't lose the room I rented in this house and I could, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but after for years putting stuff on their credit cards without telling them because I needed that money for drugs, uh, they appreciated the fact that I just asked to borrow it. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's nicer. They like that. So if we come back now to like your reintroduction into the business after rehab, um, wh where does Sirius XM come in? Sirius XM actually comes in about five years later. Okay. So I came back, I was, uh, I worked at a restaurant job, then I worked overnights doing closed captioning at the score. I'm still doing stand up. I started doing a podcast uh, with a comic that I barely knew. And we were just throwing stuff out into the ether because I was now I'm in my early 30s and it's you know there were many times where I, it felt like nothing was ever going to work out and I remember calling my parents once and my dad answered and I said I'm I'm on my break at this crappy job at the tv station and I said to my dad I go I don't know sometimes I just think like, should I quit should I go back to school and become an account. I always said an accountant, even though I'm bad at numbers, but it was like the only job I could think of where like numbers will always exist. Um, True. And, yeah, it's, I'm good at thinking about life outside of 
No, I'm not. Anyway, so I, I, I said that to my dad and my dad, like when we were younger, I think our parents were really nervous about us being performers and stuff. Um, but I think they've been really willing to kind of go with it. And I remember my dad said to me, you know, Al, when I see you on stage with a mic in your hand, that's where you're meant to be. Oh my God. That could make me like tear up right now. Cause that's yeah. the most beautiful thing your dad could say to you. It was, I mean, it was incredible. And he said, so I think you just have to stick with it. And I know it's hard right now. Um, and he said, but yeah, that's, he honestly, my dad is so proud of me and um, has so much faith in me. Um, so that was important. And of course my brother would just, my brother would be like, what are you, an idiot? <laughs> yeah. No, Allison, you're not going to do that. It's going to work out. And I was like, no. Mm -hmm. Um, so with this podcast that we started, he sent it to the program director at Sirius, uh, kind of on a whim, hoping that maybe like they would play it once a week. What was the something. premise of the podcast? Like uh, conversations with, with, comics? it was mostly, it was mostly with comics. We tried to set it up a little bit like talk radio. Like we didn't do it, any editing as if it was sort of live to air. Um, and you know, we had some like recurring games and questions and stuff that we would do with people. And um, he just happened to send it at a time when Sirius was launching a new talk channel and they had spent all of the real money on real people and were looking, <laughs> looking for two, two newbies that would take the money they had left to fill out that lineup. And, uh, yeah. And, and that's, that changed my life. That changed everything. I, I got to quit my terrible job. Um, and by the way, I wasn't only working overnight. I was working minimum 40 hours a week overnights at this television station and I was doing stand up, and I was cater waitering because none of them paid good. Oh. None of them paid good. I'm a professional talker. None of them paid well. And, um, <laughs> and so I got to for a while, just do stand up and radio. And it was, I had to, <laughs> then I had to go to therapy and talk about how I didn't know how to be happy because I'd been miserable for so long and not been able to do anything that really fulfilled me for so long. And now all of a sudden, all I have to do for money is stuff that I want to do. Well, and I didn't know how to be that person. Were, were you one of those people that, um, you know, it's almost like songwriting too. Like sometimes like the heartbreak and like the hard times lead to the best song. Like for you, was yes. it kind of like that with your content? Not, not so much that aspect of it. It was just that, that living an uncomfortable, miserable life had become like a warm blanket. And now all of a sudden <laughs> I'm like, where's my blanket? And the funniest thing is at the time, one of my roommates was K. Trevor Wilson from Letterkenny. No way. And Yes. And he is. So I used to get up at like four in the afternoon because I'm working overnights and he'd be like, hey, oh, what's up? And I'd be like, no one talked to me. And, you know, I'm having my coffee and I'm mad. And um, and then once I got the job at Sirius, I remember one day he said to me, uh, he goes, you know. I like happy Al so much better than miserable Al, like, I'm really glad you got this job. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, I guess it's more pleasant to run into me in the kitchen, isn't it? Um, I guess that was like a light bulb moment, though, right? If you if you look at, you know, your career trajectory. No, absolutely. And it was one of those things, too, where it was like, yeah, before that, there was times where I would go 24 hours without sleep because I'd work overnights. We'd record this podcast. I'd have another gig. I'd have it's impossible to be happy when you're working that much and miserable and all that kind of stuff. So it was that thing of like, yeah, everything's different now. And um, yeah, so it was, I mean, it was a, a huge deal. And also I didn't really know what I was doing on air. Like when I look at what I do now and how second nature a lot of it is, and, and my goal is still always to grow and learn and evolve as a host and an interviewer. But when I look back to the beginning, I'm like, ooh, it was some rough choppy water back then. Oh, I, I feel the same way about my stuff too. Yeah, and now it's been eight years. Yeah, and I'm still there. Me. It's only me and Arlene are the only two people that were on the original lineup of when Canada uh, Talks launched. Yeah. And, you know, I have no intention of going anywhere. So starting with a co-host, really, at SiriusXM and now being like, you know, 
Your name's on the show, The Breakdown with Alison Dorr, uh, and owning your own content. What are the differences in, you know, being in charge of what goes to air compared to doing it with someone else? Well, I think before, and it's interesting, I mean, I do still have a co-host, but it's, I'm very much the anchor now. And before I also had a co-host who was very, um, I don't have, I can't think of a, a, a synonym right now. So I'm going to say domineering. <laughs> um, and so a lot of it was me. Don't get me wrong. I, I was still myself and I'm still, but I was sort of secondary. I was kind of being dragged along and being able to be in sort of the the anchor seat at this point um, and being able to say no to things. You know, I recently made a rule. We're not interviewing psychic mediums anymore. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. And so, you know, and being having the confidence to go, no, that doesn't work for us. We're going to just gonna... knowing what's best for your show. Yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, the pandemic has been amazing in a way because of broadcasting from home. I used to kind of have a rotating group of comics that would kind of host for a week at a time as my co-host. And when we moved to broadcasting from home, Cassandra, who is also my producer, started co-hosting with me. And now that's just locked in. That's what we're doing forever. And I don't think any of us would have green lit a female host had it not been for the pandemic. And what happened is that was the only way to get it done while we were under lockdown. And now it's at the point where the listeners are so used to it, the everybody is so used to it, everybody's on board that they can't really say no now. <laughs> and so uh, that has been one of the biggest blessings of the pandemic is that she and I have a great dynamic and uh, work so well together. And she also produces the show. So she gets it on so many different levels. And so, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a much more, I think my approach is very different. And I think before I was working with someone who we just had different visions, different outlooks, different goals, different priorities. And now to be on a team where all of that is aligned. Beautiful. Oh, it feels like freedom. What, what's a, an example you would remember from, you know, the more difficult times um, of like maybe a decision that was made for the show that you really, you know, didn't agree with, whether you want to talk specific about that decision or just like the way that you were, were not able to speak up properly about it. I think I was just in a position before where if I had a different opinion, it was seen as not being a team member. Or, or being difficult as we Being difficult, yeah. yes. Okay. Being difficult or being, uh, I remember at one point being told I was being, um, I was just saying what I was saying to be contrarian and not because I really believed it. And I was like, no, this, uh, can I, am I... Can we do this thing? There's a parallel here with your label too, uh, right? And sharing the spotlight. Oh, yeah. I mean, interesting. Interesting. And I think I think about that a lot as a leader. And as now the person like on the breakdown who is sort of the face and, and the main character. And I think about that a lot with Howl and Roar is um, keeping my ego in check and making sure it's not just about me and telling my teams... I tell Cassandra and Christian all the time that I love them and they're the best. I tell Matt and Melanie at Howl and Roar all the time that I love them. They all four of those people know I can't do anything I do without them. I don't believe in self. No one has self-made anything. You cannot. It's impossible. You don't live in a vacuum. There are people that give you emotional support. There are people that are your cheerleaders. There are people that... Um, work with you, help you. And even if it's the smallest thing. And so it, I'm very careful in that, in recognizing, I don't know everything. I'm not the best. I'm not. And yes, I have my skill set where I excel and that's great, but I cannot do that without these people and try to really listen and also reiterate, like, if you ever have a problem, 
because I can, I can be a lot sometimes. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if you know that. And so I try to remember to every now and then go, don't forget if you ever have an issue, like just come to me right away. And I think they all know that now, but I still keep saying it. And I honestly think in some cases, um, especially because Melanie is so new to Howl and Roar. I'm also like, Melanie, did I tell you today that you're the best? And she's like, yes, like just, yeah, you're, it's weird now. It's so interesting. As you became a more prominent figure in this industry, you were more in touch with team. I think that's so interesting. You know, Simone Denny and I had this conversation recently. Uh, we were out at dinner and she was saying some people are in the industry and some people are of the industry. And and she what she meant by that is that you see people who get very ego driven, that get very into appearances and perception and stuff. She goes, those people are of the industry. The industry is seeped into them. And she said, Allison, you and I are in the industry. But we're very careful to stay grounded and stay who we are. And I was like, I love that. I think that's really interesting. And I think look, I spent a lot of my life hating myself. And that's, it sucks. And when I got older and I started working on these things and I started um, realizing how much we have the ability to change the way we interact with ourselves, with other people, with the world, I started really thinking about who do I want to be? What is the ideal in every situation? And my goal is to keep refining and refining. It, it, you know, you never get there, but you keep making small adjustments because when I think about the type of leader I want to be, when I think about the person I want to be, when I think about how I want people to think about me, I want them to think of me as someone who is, um, yeah, thoughtful and does their best and, and leads by example. That's very important to me. Um, is I'm not going to tell you to treat people a way that I don't treat you a and things like that. And so it's interesting too. I think if success had come younger, if I had had the success, like when I was a teenager, I assumed that by 30, I would be an A-list celebrity in Hollywood. And like, I could feel it, Sarah, I could taste it. Like it was, and I think if that had happened, I would be a nightmare human being right now. I think I, I had to stumble a lot. I had to deal with a lot. I had to fall into a lot of pits and hit a lot of bottoms and learn a lot of stuff so that when things did start working out, I could like myself and still achieve. You know what I mean? And aside from leading by example, you are building industry with what you're doing, which I think is an amazing part of your journey. Yeah, it's, you know, sometimes, I mean, when you say that, it, I immediately got scared. Um, and when I think about sort of big picture, You're creating I, space. I, I, yes. And that is what I'm trying to do. But when I think about it on too grand a scale, sometimes like I do go, oh, my God, but do people know I'm an idiot? Imposter like, syndrome. Yes. Right. Here oh, we are again. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And by the way, I see that all the time with I still remember when I first approached Bonnie McFarlane, who is one of the funniest, not even just women, funniest human beings on this planet and she's a genius and she's had tons of she writes on tv shows she's got a book she made a documentary she and her husband rich voss have this insanely popular podcast called my wife hates me she is a literal genius and the amounts of reassurance and of pitching her and of all this kind of stuff and it's fascinating to me too because yes that's kind of who i am for myself but i go yeah but bonnie has to know how awesome she is and she doesn't and I think in comedy, it's even more so because we do feel as comedians like we carry every other woman with us because there is this pervasive attitude in society that women aren't funny. Mm -hmm. And if you go to a show and there's nine dudes and one woman on the show and the one woman has a bad set, the audience leaves going, see, women aren't funny. It's not fair. Yeah. Meanwhile, four of the five men could have bad sets, but they're like, yeah, those guys did. But the other guys were hilarious. And it's just it's lack of exposure. It's all these things. But as women, every time you have a bad set, you get this feeling of like, now I've set every woman back. And so it becomes this thing where I think that's in comedy, certainly. And maybe this is in every industry, but 
that's where that feeling of I'm not ready. I'm not good enough. I'm not that. I think that fosters a lot of the imposter syndrome because if you're a woman in a male dominated field, yeah, everything you do, every mistake you make, every whatever it is, the attitude is like, well, it's because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. And so I feel like part of my job at Howl and Roar, particularly when uh, I'm dealing with women is to speak to that voice and say, no, you're amazing. I'm here. And I think a lot of women are sort of waiting for someone to tell them, hey, you're good enough to do an album. And so then I become that person. That's amazing. So this leads me perfectly into how I like to end every episode of the podcast. Is it over already? <laughs> I want to talk to you for 18 days. Well, we're going to meet up for a holiday drink. We're yes. going to get, get through all of that. Get some goss. Oh, we need some goss for sure. Uh, but set us up with a couple names uh, of, of women or female identifying um, people in the industry that you think have great stories to share on a podcast like this. Oh, wow. Sing their praises. Great stories to sh share on a podcast like this. Um, well, I think there's lots. And I think one in particular, Kate Davis, who- I want to have her on so badly. <laughs> yes. She also has a very cool podcast that unfortunately she had to pause during COVID because she talks to people with terminal illness. Um, but she is- uh, someone who, first of all, we've been friends for a very long time. She was the first album we ever recorded for Howl and Roar because she was one of those headliners mm -hmm. that had been doing it for years that had nothing. So I, she was the first comic I ever pitched. I said, listen, I think this is what I'm going to do. And I want to make an album with you. And I want it to be the first album we make. Um, but she has had so many experiences, both just, you know, being on the road, but also she was told by a booker uh, they basically stopped booking her when she turned 40 and the booker said, no one wants to hear a woman over 40 talk. Um, Kate Davis only gets funnier. Just so y'all know. know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on. She's, uh, I mean, she is wonderful. Um, another person, although she's difficult because you want her to tell stories, but she gets self-conscious. Uh, Sabrina Douglas is not only a hysterical stand-up comedian. She is also a full-time nurse and a mother of five. Pardon me. Yes. Okay. Make and you note, <laughs> she's one of those people that in every story she tells is accidentally hilarious. You know what I mean? She could be telling a really serious story, but she makes it funny. And then it's one of those things where you have to apologize for it. You're like, no, I know it's just, you're saying it funny, but this is tragic, but you're saying it funny. Yeah. Um, and uh, so she's, oh, another one is Rebecca Kohler, who is also one of my favorite people in the world. And just, um, there's so many experiences and uh, Rebecca is also a wonderful talker and she's very smart and very curious. And so the way she looks at the world is so fascinating to me. Because when I tell her a story, she'll go, but also what about this? And I'll go, oh, I didn't ask. And then she's mad at me because I didn't ask this other person enough questions. And I'm like, my brain doesn't think of those questions. You're insane. <laughs> okay. It's not my fault. So yeah, there's, there's three good ones right there. Very different too. Awesome. Okay. And uh, to, to wrap up my last episode of 2021, what's coming up with you and the breakdown and, and all things howl and roar that we could plug. Well, I'll tell you this. The breakdown has gotten very exciting. We've got a couple of interviews at the end of this year that uh, were big sort of uh, we we were manifesting. Big and, gets, we call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, big gets. And for us, you know what I mean, in, in terms of people we like and stuff. And so that's been really exciting. I feel like we're on a, a great roll. And we're going to come into the new year just reinvigorated and... Um, hopefully continue this trend of really getting to talk to some of the people that we think are really exciting in in the industry. And everyone knows I love TV so much. And so when we get to talk to someone from one of the shows that I binge and I love, to me, that is so exciting. So like we just talked to Luke Grimes from Yellowstone. Nice. And uh, yeah, and we made sure we did that one over Zoom because that guy, you want to look directly at that face. Oh, yeah. When you're talking to him. Mm -hmm. Um. And then coming up this week, we're going to be joined by um, 
Eddie uh, Agdegby, who I literally just a week and a half ago was raving about how amazing he was. And then his publicist just happened to reach out. And he's, he's on uh, Startup. He is in Harder They Fall, the new movie on Netflix. He is so incredible. And so we're going to be talking to him on Monday. Like, I can't wait. And uh, yeah, so that's very So exciting. that's actually today. That's today. That's today. Episode release date is Monday. So go check that out uh, in the SiriusXM app, which is free for like one more day, actually. Do it. Okay, awesome. And then with Howl and Roar, we have a lot of exciting stuff planned and, and new things. We're also... Um, We've got some American comics on board, and so we're going to be expanding outside of Canada a little bit, which we've uh, done a, a tiny bit in the past, but um, more so. And we've, we're also hoping to do some video stuff. Uh, right now, Omicron is freaking me out a little bit, mm-hmm. and so we'll see what our timeline is, but we have some... Very big, exciting things, hopefully, that we're going to be able to pull off in 2022. Yeah. And so if people want to follow on social media at Howl underscore Roar. And we'll put all this stuff in the episode notes. Yeah. And so that's where we're going to be sharing all this stuff we're doing. But it's we got some fun stuff in the in the pipe. As they Kudos say. to you, my friend. Honestly, everything that you have done since I've met you is mind blowing. And I love the work that you're doing. And I'm so happy that you could come on the podcast. Well, I'm thrilled that you invited me. Like, I love this show. I think you're, you're doing such a great job. But also, I really want people to know that when I say that you are one of the hardest working people, that's not I, I feel like it gets said a lot in this industry. Uh, and I want everyone to know Sarah works 15 times more than you think she does and you are so committed and i still see you going to events and doing things and i'm like why isn't she sleeping what's happening (laughs) and then you still added this to your plate as well and doing this show and so we're just having a straight up love affair and inspiration fest and i look forward to the day when i can just peek over the top of the desk and be like there she is doing the magic Yep, basically a straight up love affair. And trust me when I say that we could have stayed on for hours. It's Sarah Burke here, the host of the Women in Media podcast. And I'd like to thank you for checking out this episode or any episode on this wild ride. Uh, 2021 was the year I launched the podcast. And although I'm taking a little hiatus until 2022, the good news is there are 24 episodes with fabulous women and fabulous stories uh, that you can go back to anytime you'd like. Looking ahead to 2022, by the way, uh, my first guest in the new year will be Terry Hart, who is an entertainment reporter, host, and producer. And she's a little bit of an OG when it comes to this business. So I look forward to sharing her story with you soon. Happy holidays to you and yours. And thank you so much for checking out the Women in Media podcast. I'm Allison Langer. I'm Zarina Fry. I'm Andrea Askowitz, and we're the hosts of Writing Class Radio the best writing podcast in the world. In the world? How do you know? Have you listened to every single writing with you? You're going to fight with me now. You're going to fight with me now. Writing Class Radio publishes true, amazing stories from writers like you, and you learn how to make your own writing better. Listen to us wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. Another Sound Off Media Company podcast.